Hello, hello, and welcome to Blah Blah Black Sheep, a weekly yarny podcast where I, Sarah Korth of SEK Handmade, answer your yarny questions. I'm here for you. <laughs> welcome or welcome back. I am so, so glad you are here. Friends, it's fall, it's fall, and it's feeling like fall. Um, we actually said last night to my youngest, um, you know, he had the vent in his um, room closed, like the floor vent. And we said, you got to keep this open. You know, now that it's winter, we need the heat to get up here. And he goes, ah, it's not winter. And we're like, it's going to be feeling like winter. We had a frost advisory last night. So it's getting real chilly and I am here for it. <laughs> Today, you guys, I'm so proud. I'm wearing my Zoe shawl. If you watched last week's episode, this shawl was not done. And now it is. And I feel pretty good about that. Um, I want to show you how I'm wearing it because I'm wearing it. It's kind of a, a summery um, piece, but I'm wearing it in a very cozy way. So let me show you. Let me show you the shawl and let me show you how I'm wearing it. So this is Zoe very open um, fabric with a little lacy border there with gorgeous texture. Um, you guys, this is a super quick make. If I had focused on it, I probably could have had it done in less than a week. Of course, it took me longer than that, but that's beside the point. Okay, so uh, my favorite shape, the boomerang, a crescent moon kind of shape. She wraps kind of up and around to stay cozy around you, which is lovely and helpful when wearing. So I'm gonna put the center, I'm gonna put the point right in the center, and then I'm gonna pull this up all the way around my neck because we were in the low 50s today when I dropped the boys off at school. Then I'm gonna wrap one side around, keeping it nice and flat. I'm gonna take the other side, I'm gonna wrap it around, keeping it also nice and flat. And then I'm going to say this side is a little longer. So keeping the border along the edge, I'm going to wrap it under first and I'm going to try to keep the border showing. And I'm just going to kind of tuck it and then tuck it in the top. Then I'm going to take that piece that I just threw around my shoulder. I did not mean to be quite so dramatic with that. And I'm going to layer it over the top of that one that I just did. So I'm just kind of tucking it and tucking it so that I have the, the layers of the lace and a nice coziness around my neck. And there you go. And then if you want to kind of like open it up a little bit so it's not super tight. I don't love things to be super tight around my neck. And then I do like to kind of pull back around the shoulders. And there we go. Um, the yarn for this shawl is yarn that I had in my stash. Pat myself on the back for using yarn in my stash. <laughs> um, maybe we'll do a little stash show and tell sometime. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. I have a lot, I have a lot of stash. Um, anyways, so I'm proud of myself for using yarn for my stash. The sad thing about that though is I bought this yarn it feels like maybe just a couple years ago but it's probably more than that and it's loopy luna fibers yarn and it's no more I checked last week I said I don't know if she's dying anymore and then I went and looked it up and she's not her website is down like there's nothing so that makes me a little sad but that's okay. I enjoyed her yarn while she was dying and there are lots of talented dyers. So anyways, um, so I won't be linking to her because she's not dying yarn. Anywho, what is bringing me joy? My friends. I, before kids, was an avid music listener, listener to her. I am from the generation of Columbia House CD Club. I have, between my husband and I, we have 
lots and lots of CDs. Um, I don't know if I told you guys, but I lost, I had an old CD player and CDs. I've put them somewhere just where I'll remember them, I'm sure. I can't find them. Anyways, um, I was listening to a podcast that I enjoy listening to. Um, it is called The Next Right Thing. And she was talking to a music duo. Whoop, 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 back up. I haven't listened to a lot of music lately. And I don't know, like, since kids, which lately, my oldest is 11. Like, that's a long time. We listened to a lot of kid music when they were really little. They are getting into their own music preferences, um, which I have a love-hate relationship with because it's great that they're doing it, but now they're like playing music constantly. And don't tell me to put them in headphones because I want to know what they're listening to. <laughs> Even if I don't love what they're listening to, they have okay taste. Anyways, but I think partly because of the constant noise of children, I, I just don't have, I like to have it quiet a lot of times when I'm working or I listen to podcasts or audiobooks. So I have not listened to as much music as I used to. So I'm listening to a podcast and in the podcast, the host, Emily P. Freeman, interviews a music duo. And um, so then I was like, well, these people just seem like sweet as can be. I should go check out their music. And so I did. Oh, I love it. So I have found a new music duo. I'm like strongly debating, like, do I, do I get, is it worth it to get a, a Spotify, to pay for Spotify premium? I was going to call it a membership. I'm like, that's not really what it is. Is it worth paying for Spotify premium? Um, to be able to listen without ads because they're, oh, I'm guessing they do this to get your attention, but their ads are like nails on a chalkboard to me. I'm like, nice music, nice music. And then it's like, get your car and shirt. And I'm like, Whoa! it like ruins the mood for me. <laughs> so, I don't know. I don't know, but I'm really enjoying their music. Okay. The band name is low land, low land hum. They kept saying it really fast, low land hum. And I thought it was Lola and hum, low land hum. Uh, I'll find like a logo or something and put it up here or just type it so that you can see what it is. Their music is just real. It's so relaxing and gorgeous. The harmonies are amazing. It's just brought me so much joy. And so go give them a listen. I hope it brings you joy too. Um, yeah. I hope it's like you can listen and craft and ah, love, love, love. All right. Let's talk small businesses. I'm mean, going to have kind of like a two small business section here because we're going to talk about some small businesses that I chose specifically as small businesses. And then I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of yarn dyers because the first question is a yarn question. So we're gonna have like two sections, but never fear, never fear. I will put all of the links to all of the peoples and all of the businesses in the uh, show notes below. They're right below or off to the side, depending on what device you're working, working on, looking at. And um, so you can just go click them. You don't have to search them down. I, I gotcha. Um, so the first small businesses are two. First, I am like all in the, um, I'm going to move that pillow. It's bothering me. All in the fall theme. I'm ready for all things fall. I bought these earrings this summer and I've just been waiting to wear them. Stop swinging. There we go. They're just the, these gorgeous like fall, I guess they're not necessarily fall leaves. They're just leaves, but that makes me think of fall and leaves on the ground and their gorgeousness. I'm going to be wearing these a bunch. They're, you know, wood. So they're neutral. You can, they go with everything, including my shawl. 
<laughs> these are by Rumors Run Wild. Rumors is spelled incorrectly. So I will link below. They have, uh, guys, I wish I hadn't. So to make sure I got you all the right information, I already looked up their website, their Etsy shop. They have so many great earrings. I'm almost definitely going to go back and buy more. <laughs> uh, I can't help myself. So I will link that down below as well. So you don't, you don't have to worry about their spelling and hunting them down. Uh, my other small business is one you know I love, Cheeky Ceramics. I got another new mug. I got the Boo mug. I talked about this a while ago with the ghosts. And it says, I'm going to read it because I'm a haunt mess without coffee. And look at even like the handle is, is really pretty. And then I'll take a, once I finish my cup of coffee, I'll take a picture of the inside. Cause again, again, Rin has outdone themselves with the glaze on the inside of the cup. Okay. When I was, I think this was more popular when my mom was little, but when I was little, my mom had a mug from her childhood and in the bottom of the ceramic mug was a little ceramic I think it was a cat and so it was so fun to like drink your hot chocolate from it and then like you get to the bottom and like boop, there's a cat I loved it so much and I feel like this mug is a little bit like that like as you drink down your beverage more and more of the gorgeous glaze inside is revealed and it just makes me so happy. It makes me so happy. So when I'm uh, at least close to the bottom, <laughs> if I was smart, I would have snagged a picture before I put my coffee in it, but I didn't. Um, I'll, I'll snag as best a picture I can. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not great at great at photographing the inside of mugs but I'll grab a little picture and put it up here so you can see because it's gorgeousness so those are my two small businesses I have a couple quick announcements the Olivio mystery crochet along has started it started on Sunday friends this is this first clue is snippy snappy quick 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 um and so if you have not joined us yet you can and you will not be behind by the end of the week you can totally catch up um i'm gonna show you now i'm like where's my other one oh i'm gonna knock stuff over i have so much stuff to show today um since clue one was revealed on Sunday, I feel safe sharing this on Wednesday. Uh, if you don't want to see, just close your eyes for a minute. I won't. I'm going to share it in the, one of the questions too. So. so this is clue one. A little long skinny triangle here. And with a gorgeous texture. I am obsessed with these stitches. Let me see if I can actually show you. There we go. This is a hard one to show on. I was looking because I'm, I'm making three more. I have my original sample that I just like whoosh, plowed through. And then I had my like fancy yarn that I knew I wanted it in. And then I thought I was going to need a third one for, uh, I'm not going to tell the story. Anyways, and then, but then I got attached. And so I had to make it anyways. And then I asked, um, my local yarn shop owner if she would like a sample because I'm doing a class there and she said yeah and look she picked out pink too so I'm doing all the pink shawls if you want to see all of them um check out my Instagram where I I will share all the pictures so they're each turning out just you know a little differently and um so much fun this is 
um, a special yarn that has a Z twist instead of an S twist. I, I don't know if I'm going the right way there with my fingers, but it's supposed to twist more when you crochet with it instead of untwist. It is Mota by Wool Dreamers. I like guess wool something. Wool Dreamers. I, it's a very rustic yarn, um, but I'm enjoying it and I cannot wait. I'm going to give it a good hot block. I'm going to soak it in really warm water, as hot as I can get out of my tap, and see if that like floofs the fibers and softens the fibers a little bit. Um, but dang, this will be cozy. Not that anybody's going to be wearing it outside because it's a shop sample, but <laughs> that's beside the point. Maybe I'll make something else out of that yarn if it, if I really love it. So that's going on. Check out down below. If you are joining us and you're not part of either the Facebook group or the Instagram chat, you should be. I mean, no pressure, obviously, but, um, we are having a lot of fun, like sharing yarns and chit chatting about things. I'm giving like little reminders of things. Um, so we'd love to have you join one of those communities. The crochet cancer challenge, I guess announcement number two, the crochet cancer challenge has started. It is running lots of fun hats so far and tomorrow, Thursday, October 12th, I want to make sure I get the right date on that, <laughs> is my day for the Crochet Cancer Challenge. And so just for 24 hours, uh, free hat pattern. And now I'm like, I wish I had grabbed my hat. I could show it to you as like a little sneak peek. Let me do that real quick. It's right around here. I grab real quick. Okay. So this is my, this is my Nolan hat. Isn't pretty gorgeous texture. This is not hard. It's very repetitive. You can do it. You can totally do it and it'll be amazing. So woo -woo -woo. free pattern tomorrow. Um, if you want to be sure not to miss out, um, down below in the show notes, is a link to sign up for my emails and I'll send you an email tomorrow to remind you that tomorrow's the day, but it'll say today's the day because it'll be tomorrow. <laughs> Anyways, even if you're watching this later, if you're watching in the month of October, the crochet cancer challenge runs the whole month. And so I will also link to Christine, our wonderful host, blog and you can go there any day and grab uh the hat of the day so there we go look at this pew, pew, pew. oh i was like i'm moving and grooving but it's it's already been a little while anyways what better reason than to do questions so let's do some questions um I, I was on last week looking at questions to choose them and I saw this week's question and I was like, Oh, that is such a good question. Um, and such a tough question, which is awesome, but I need to prepare a little bit. I wanted to grab, grab all the things for it so that I could give a thorough, as thorough as I could of an answering of this question. So we're diving in. I have a whole chair. Weston is sleeping in his kennel. Hopefully he stays put there because I've like really like narrowed the area here because I have a whole chair of stuff that I want to show you just to answer this question. We're going to be looking at lots of yarn and talking about it. So that being said, question number one, how do I determine the length of the run when buying multicolored yarns. When choosing them for a specific pattern, how can you tell how they will actually look? Oh, yes, right? Okay, so what we're talking about is when you buy a yarn that is not a solid or a semi-solid, how do you tell how long 
each color section is. And then how does that translate into the fabric you're going to get? So there are, there are lots and lots of, um, of options here. I mean, everything, everything, there's really everything because with hand dyed yarn, everybody's doing it differently and different skeins can actually have different amounts of colors. So how do you determine that? There, there are two things that make this real tricky. One is if you are shopping online, not being able to pick up the yarn and look at it and like move the fibers apart and kind of like see how the dye is laid on the yarn. That definitely ups the level of difficulty <laughs> when determining that. The other thing, oh, what did I do with that one? The other thing that ups the level of difficulty is when your yarn is not in a hank. This is a hank and most um, yarn dyers, this is how they uh, put up their yarn for sale. Um, I'm getting all these little orange fibers in all my things and I don't have any idea where they're coming from. Um, so when it's in a ball, I'm looking because I had a ball here. Ah, no. Ah, there it is. Okay. When it's put up in a ball like this, you don't, it, you don't see the whole yarn. So I was looking, I got sucked in by Isolda. She's a wonderful knitting designer and she's designed these super cool, her, her, first of all, her brain just works differently than mine, but she's designed these super cool mitts with a really neat construction. And I was like, yes, I want to make those. So I was like, I need the kind of a rusticy yarn. Um, and, and I picked this up and I was looking at it and I was like, that'll be pretty. It's got blues. Uh, you can see, let me see if I can take the ball band off of this. You can see that it kind of, if I had taken the ball band off, it would have been more evident. The issue I'm going to show you right here. You can see there's kind of a slow fade between colors. Um, I'm not going to get to that because it goes all, all over the place. Um, but there's kind of a slow fade between the colors. And so this is going to cause subtle stripes that kind of fade into each other, but definitely stripes. Now, if I had seen this online, I would have thought blues and greens. And when I picked this up, I thought blues and greens. And then I was like looking at it and, okay, this ends better. And I get looking at it and you guys look at that. It goes all the way through. It variegates. So it's not just blues and green. It doesn't just shift between blues and greens. It goes all the way into, it's a whole rainbow, reds, oranges, yellows. No purple, it doesn't look like but it variegates a whole entire rainbow in there. So this is totally different. This is going to cause you stripes. This is going to cause, um, subtle stripes, um, or fading stripes. Cause you can see the colors fade more slowly into each other. If you got, um, red next to blue, next to purple, next to pink, next to orange, next to green. Colors that aren't fading into each other, you're going to get a hard stripe. This is going to be more of a gradient stripe. Um, so when you're looking online and you can't physically pick up the ball and I mean, part of the issue that I thought this was all the same was because with the ball band on this, can I get the ball band back on? Uh, that middle part where you could see the fade was hidden. And so I, I just didn't notice it until I, <laughs> until I picked it up and was like, Oh, more colors in there. 
So I'm actually probably not going to use that for this project because of the construction. It goes like one way and then it goes another way and then it goes another way. And I think while those stripes might um, accentuate the unique construction, I'm not sure that that's what I want. So I will probably go with a more all over color. So the runs of this are pretty long, the each color, because you can see you're not fading. You're going to go through all of these greens. You're going to pull all of that green off the outside of the ball before you start to fade into the blues. So that's quite a bit. That's why I was saying, I'll show you the color run. And then I was like, no, I'll pull yards of <laughs> yarn off before we're going to get to a different color. Um, so seeing it in a ball like this can be a little more challenging than seeing it in a hank. If you are seeing it in person, you can take a hank like this. Maybe ask the yarn shop owner if you're, oh, a bald eagle. Oh, that's cool. Um, <laughs> my neighbors are having work done on their house. I keep looking out there because people keep coming. Um, if you can open these up and take them apart, that can be even easier to see the run of color because then you can like lay it completely out and say like color here in the three inches, five inches, uh, half the hank, uh, you've got the length of the color. So that's a great way to see your color runs if you were in person and if you are welcome to, to open up the hank. I know I was always nervous about that um, when I was just first learning. I'm not nervous about it at my local yarn shop because A, I know how to put them back together if I open them up. And B, I, I know that Sarah is totally cool with people opening stuff up. So, um, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about different color placement on the yarn first. Friends, the whole, whole gambit of, of options is available. You can have um, self-striping yarn. Mm. Oh, dang. I'm gonna mm, try really hard to remember. I'll put a picture of it here. I don't tend to buy self-striping yarn but I inherited some self-striping yarn from my mom's stash. And I'll put it here. You can see in a self-striping yarn, the stripes of the really distinct colors. Uh, a self-striping yarn when put up in a hank has a really distinct pattern. And so once you know that that's a self-striping yarn, you're going to be able to recognize that. And then you're gonna know that's gonna give me stripes. Now, here's the deal. A self-striping yarn is going to give you stripes, but the uh, distance you are working your fabric is going to change the width of the stripes. <clears throat> so if you pull out a self-striping yarn and you make a small swatch, you might get zero stripes in there because the amount of yarn that makes a stripe, you don't finish it in a small swatch. <clears throat> but if you do a self-striping yarn on the body of a sweater, your, depending on your size, your stripes are going to get smaller and smaller the larger the distance you travel. So let's even take this away from garments and let's, we'll go back to garments in just a second, but take it away from garments. Let's just talk scarves. If you're making a scarf that's this wide, because you're using less yardage and every pass, your stripes are gonna be thicker. If you're making a scarf that is this wide, because you're using more yardage with every pass, your stripes are going to be thinner. So that's something to think about. The other thing to think about when making a garment in self-striping yarn is if it's panels, um, A, 
getting those pants, like if you want a matching seam all the way down the side, you're going to be managing the yarn a lot. That's going to be challenging. Um, but even if you don't worry about that, if you have a cardigan and you have like, let's say this panel is this wide, right? Both the same. The back is this wide. And then your sleeves are this wide. That way. <laughs> How many sleeves are this wide? Not even a child's. Um, because of the different sizes of the panels, you're going to end up with different widths of stripes. Even if you are making a sweater where you're doing like the body, right? And all the body is one ish size of stripe. If you use that same arm or same yarn for the arm and don't make adjustments to how fast the colors changes, you're going to end up with fatter stripes on your sleeves because the circumference of your arm is much smaller than the circumference of your entire body. So that's how self striping yarn is going to land. Oh, I should tell you, cause I'm not going to come back to this one. This is a yarn that my mom purchased. Uh, oh goodness sakes alive. Oh good. It's typed out here. I was like, what letters are those even? Um, <clears throat> Kauni, K-A-U-N-I, um, Denmark, I'm probably saying that totally wrong, uh, or pronouncing it totally wrong, is this yarn, if I can find them, who knows when she bought this, um, if I can find them, I'll link to them, they do have a website, oh no, that's an email, I'll link to them below, if I can find them. I've really done myself in pulling extra things in that I didn't think I was going to because <laughs> I already have lots of stuff. Okay, so let's start looking at other types of yarn, not self-striping yarn, but just variegated and speckled yarn. And let's talk about um, how that's going to land on fabric. So let's start with the, the widest. So this is a Wonderland yarn. Um, it's called Marianne. I bought this at local yarn shop day and let's look at this in two ways. Let's look at this in its hank. So you can see I've got some pretty big sections of color here, right? So if we follow just like this one, it starts here. That lighter the kind of creamy color with speckles on it goes all the way around to here. So that's a pretty good section. We're talking, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 inches of mostly solid white. Okay. And then we've got some chunks of solids. We've got like one, two, maybe three chunks of kind of more solid where it's got that deep gray and the citrony, um, greeny yellow. And so right there, you can see there are big, big spaces of, um, of color. There's blocks of color. So I'm going to open this up and let's look at it opened up. So when the yarn is dyed, it is dyed like this, opened up. Now it could be dyed, uh, if I had to guess, maybe like this, because you see how then those colors line up and those colors line up and then we've got these colors, okay? So you can see I've got, I was totally wrong. Look at that, that's way, way more than 10 inches. That's probably closer to I don't know, a lot more inches of a really open, uh, speckly light area. Then I've got a chunk of green, a chunk of gray, a chunk of green, a chunk of light, green, gray, green again. Okay. This yarn is 
specifically designed for I'm going to say I'm going to put a name on it and I'm going to say right up front that I don't know that this is the exact name or if it is the exact name there's lots of meanings of this. This is like an assigned pooling yarn. That's what it's made for. So the idea is not not the really elaborate ones where you like make a flannel. That's not the word like a plaid pattern. I've seen those really elaborate ones where you take a yarn and somehow you make a plaid design just with one string of yarn. I don't know. This is one of those ones where you, you work until you get to one of these chunks of color and then you do like a special stitch that kind of like pulls all of that color in one spot. And so the main, uh, the main color is going to be this lighter color and then you're going to have little like special stitches that assign all of this to one spot so that you end up with um with little blips and blobs um of those special colors so what this is going to give you is if even if you don't use a pattern that specifically is for the assigned colors what it's going to give you is big spots of concentrated color in areas of um, the lighter color. So that's how this is going to fall. Again, where those land and if they are together or in totally different spots is going to depend on the stitch pattern and is going to depend on how big your piece is. If your piece is small, you're not going to travel through those color changes as quickly and you're going to end up with big blocks of these colors in your lighter. If you've got a wider like a wider fabric, um, you're going to end up with, oh dear, I just put a hair in my eyeball. You're going to end up with narrower amounts, but depending on the yardage and the stitch, you may end up with them traveling in a pattern that may or may not be desirable. I'm going to try to stay away from my two cents and personal preference for now. <laughs> and then we'll come back to that. This, especially because the colors are so distinct from each other, the very dark, the very light, the very bold, it's going to be super evident those um, where the color lays. There's no blending. Okay. Um, so something like this then you can see big splotches of color throughout splotches. That's maybe not a, that's not maybe a nice term, but I can't think of anything else. So the color lays in really bold, really um, distinct and contrasting. That's a word I'm looking for. Um, bits of color here. And so this is going to give you bold contrasting bits of color throughout. Again, those may all lay separate from each other and they may end up looking a little more polka dotty depending on your fabric or they may end up um, being Oh gosh, that didn't work great. Um, they may end up lining up and you may end up with like kind of a, a stripey zigzaggy situation going on. It will depend on the size and the stitch of your fabric. Now, I picked up quite a bit back. So I'm going essentially from... Um, really separated to less separated, <laughs> more, more cohesive. 
is my what I'm trying to do here. So the next step here is this guy. Now, when I just looked at this guy when I purchased him a while ago, this was probably a couple years ago, I was like, yes, love those colors. So pretty. And just looking at the Hank, I felt like it was pretty all over different colors. But now that I really analyze it carefully, do you see what I see? Big block of color, big block of color, big block of color, big block of color. So when I open this up, you're also going to see, oh gosh, look at that. See now the things that I thought were separate blocks of color. Look, look at how far that pink runs through there. So that's going to give me a pretty good section of pink as I go through. And I would, I wouldn't have even guessed that hanked up like that. So this is a smaller, uh, block of pink, but this is a really big one. And then the rest of it is kind of this, um, tealy speckly. So that's going to give you, oh dear, oh dear. Tap nab it. My ring got all caught up. Okay. I'm going to take that off while I twist this around because I don't want to cause a mess. <gasps> cause a mess. Okay. So that's more likely what I thought were little bits of variegation when you pull the hank apart or little bits of color blocking. When you pull the hank apart, you can see that it's a lot longer run of color there, which as you might have noticed, surprised me. So again, if you can pull the hank open like that, that can really help. Uh, there are some dyers that when you buy online, they will have multiple pictures. So they'll have a picture of it hanged up and then they'll have a picture of it laid out. And that's really helpful because then you see the run of color. So let's look at the next skein and see if I did a better job. Guys, this is long and I'm sorry. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. Okay, so I have this hank that you can see. Oh, can you see? Gosh, it's, it's fluorescent. So it has some splotches of color like here that are pretty contrasty, but they seem small. So let's open it up and see. Oh heavens, this is kind of a mess. <sighs> do, 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 do. This, this is not my real pain to hang up. Okay, I think I figured it out. I think I figured it out, yay. Okay, so now, even now, as we open this up, can you see, no, because it's on the inside. Can you see that block of color there that is not, it's not as small as I thought it was. So I'm gonna say this contrasting block of color runs nine, 10 inches. Now it's not all the way throughout. Another thing to do is when you kind of open the fibers, you can see that that got kind of placed on one side of the fiber and not all the way through. And so that's not going to consistently have that, that, uh, different section, but then there is kind of a splotch again. I apologize for the word splotch, <laughs> but it's not on the back side. My guess is that these were laid in with a speckling technique. And so uh, that's why it didn't saturate all the way through to both sides. So this could leave some color pooling too. Now, let me talk to you about the yarn that I am using. I have a couple yarns that I'm using on projects. And so I can show you what it looks like. I don't have them in the hank anymore though. Okay. One thing at a time, Sarah. Um, I don't have some of these in the hank, so you're not gonna be able to see it in the hank. So, and I don't think I took a picture of this one. So this is a yarn 
that was in my mom's stash. It's caked up, but because I have it caked, I can show you the color runs. Do you see how short those are? We've got like a salmon -y color and then it fades to yellow and then to kind of a peach and then to kind of a pink and then to kind of a green and then a darker green and then a lighter green and then a black and now we're back to salmon. So within uh, 24 inches, not even 36 inches, we've run the whole gambit of the colors. So those are very short color runs. And what that's going to give you is not a stripe. Even if you were working a sock or something very small circumference, I don't think it's going to give you a stripe. This is what it gave me in my Tunisian pattern. So the return pass is worked in that fun, bright color. And you can see it leaves just little bits, like the variegating is goes by real quick, right? And because of how quickly it goes through the colors, even from far back, there's no distinct pattern to it. Now that is partly because of the size of the pattern, right? This is pretty small circumference, but it's also going all the way around. This is worked in one solid piece. And because of that, they didn't line up. There's no distinct um, color pooling there with the short run. Had it been a different circumference, might they have lined up and made like kind of a little checkerboardy feel with those black? Maybe, maybe. It's, it's a little hard to say. Now, I did want to show you what I'm talking about with the color pooling. Um, and I was going to go out <laughs> and grab um, pictures of other people's um, projects because I try to avoid this. And then I started one of my um, Olivia patterns. And lo and behold, it was the perfect example of this. Let's hope this bright color is going to show up well enough. Okay, so can you see, this isn't necessarily representing the color of the yarn well, but that's not the point. So can you see that it's pooling and you can see it pool. It pulls in kind of a boomerang there. And can you see how it changes how it pulls based on how wide my fabric is? So as my fabric gets wider, they kind of end up pooling right on top of each other in this kind of boomerang pattern. But as my fabric gets smaller, they end up looking more like kind of spots. This is not a yarn I would have necessarily expected to do this. If you want to see it in the hank, um, I last week, on last week's episode, I showed it in the hank. Benton helped me wind this ball. It's a little bit of a mess. But looking at this ball, you can see the color changes are far more subtle. Like so subtle, I'm not even sure you're going to be able to see them on a single strand. We go from like a lighter pink to a deeper purple. And then I'm going back to a lighter pink. So the run of the deeper purple is just this long. So not super long. And then I go into a lighter pink, almost to like a white with some speckles. And that runs maybe about this long. And then I've got a longer run of the really, really hot pink. Because I'm going back to there before I get back into the purpley. And that change and the fabric and the stitch and the way it's lining us up is what's called causing, causing the color pooling. So this yarn, let's see, let's take a look at this. So this is um, a hand dyed yarn from Fatima. It's, I really like Fatima's one of a kind yarns a lot. So you can't get this color from her anymore. Um, but it was mostly teal with some deep purples and maroonies in it. 
and you can see that because the contrasting colors were pretty small blips, it caused less kind of pooling and more irregular pooling. It didn't like you can see there's a little more pooling there. There's a little more pooling there, but it's not in the same kind of fashion where it really made a pattern with the pooling. So this doesn't bother me as much. The other thing is that this, this just the shape of a shawl that's worked from here out and wider and wider and wider changes where the color lands, right? Just by the nature of the fact that it's growing, growing, growing versus a sweater or a hat or a cowl that's never changing the circumference or the distance of the yarn. So that's something to think about. Now, I want to show you, oh, I just sat on a bunch of yarn. I wanna show you this guy. This is a Malabrigo, which if you know Malabrigo, you probably recognize this right away as a Malabrigo. Malabrigo does a really good job most of the time. No, I'm, I have not found a yarn that I've had a lot of pooling issues with Malabrigo. They do their runs in such a way that they are short enough and blended enough and inconsistent enough that I don't tend to get weird pooling with their yarn. This is this. So you can see some of the darker ends up kind of, I ran out of yarn, ends up in kind of um, little spots, but it doesn't create that like boomerang like it did in uh, my Olivio that I was showing you. This is also Malabrigo and same thing. You can see the little spots, but there's no like distinct pattern that they make up, which is my personal preference. So I have been talking for a while, but because I think this is such an interesting topic and because it's really challenging. There are so many factors that fall into how it's going to lay on your fabric that it can be very hard to tell until you try. So I want to talk, I want to give you, this is, I'll, okay, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask a question that nobody answered, asked, but I think is important. <laughs> and goes along with this. The next logical step to me from um, how do you know the runs and then how do you know how it's gonna lay when you choose a pattern, which we've gone over. Um, if you have like more specific questions, though, like ask away. But I think the question, the next logical step then is what I'm gonna call question number two. Question number two. How do you avoid that unusual color pooling? Here's where I'm gonna give you my personal preference. I am not a fan when yarn does the kind of pooling that is happening in my Olivio here. I don't love the, the, the pooling making these shapes in it. If this were wrapped around my middle in a, a sweater, I would be like, uh-uh, nope, I'd be frogging that. And I would be, um, I'd be choosing different yarn because it really bothers me. That of course, of course, is total personal preference. And you may look at that and be like, ah, oh, that's not bad, they're pretty similar. And when I held it further back, I too was like, that, that's not terrible. But I've definitely seen ones that the, the color changes are a lot more contrasting and you end up with those zigzags and stuff that if you're wearing it in a sweater, as you change circumference, maybe you go in for a waist and out for some, out, out for hips, those change from, they like grow or shrink based on the change in circumference. And that, is not my preference. If it is your preference, pfft, 
do, then you don't need this. It's fine. But if you would like to try to avoid it, I have a couple tips. One is right when from the start, choose a yarn that is less likely to have those pooling issues. So something that is highly variegated in lots of colors that blend into each other instead of really um, strong changes. This has lots of colors in it, but they're a lot more the same um, tone uh, value. So they're not like a lot of light and a lot of really dark they are more uniform in their uh, tone quality. Um, or go with a, a semi-solid or a solid. The other thing is you need to think about is how your what you're wearing is going to lay on you. This ended up having a lot more um, distinct colors. There's kind of a really light and then there's a much darker and then there's even kind of like some reds and browns because I'm wearing it in a shawl that is moving and is scrunched. You can't see those as well. If it were a flat piece of fabric, that's going to stay flat across my arm, across my body. It's going to be more evident. Those, those pockets of color. Um, so choosing, whether you use that yarn on something that's a little more um, scrunched, like a cowl, they might be really distinct, but when you put it on and it kind of scrunches down around your neck because nobody's laying the fabric completely flat, they're not as noticeable. A hat that's gonna sit uh, unscrunched across your head, it's gonna be more evident. So think about the yarn you're choosing if you don't, if you really want to avoid that. But if you already have some of that yarn and you want to use it for a project, think about how the project is going to lay. And if it's something that's going to be, you know, a scarf is going to be wrapped around you a bunch, um, a cowl is going to be kind of squished down, those kind of hide or mask those uh, color pooling. Um, the other thing that you can do, and I know th this is not my favorite, which is another reason why I avoid, and I'm not, I'm not, I say this, but if it's real bad on other pieces, I might. You can alternate skeins. So if you've got skeins that have big pockets of color like that, if you alternate skeins, um, you are more likely, and you may want to, as you wind, pull from the outside of one cake and the inside from another cake, but you're sh mixing up, you know, when you use one skein and the color is all laid on that skein in a really specific pattern, you're come when you use the one skein, you're coming across the same pockets of color at the same time again and again and again and again and again. If you can work one way around the skein and then with another skein, even if it's exactly the same, be working in a different direction and alternating the skeins, you're going to end up mixing the, the way the colors are laid in a more unique fashion, in a less uniform fashion. And so you're not, it's not at all, but you're, it's going to mask the, the way the color lays and jumble it up a little more. So it's not as likely to be those really distinct patterns that you saw in my Olivia. So those are my two suggestions for avoiding color pooling. Oh my heavens, you guys, I have been talking for so long. I hope though that you found this interesting and helpful. When you go to buy hand dyed yarn, it is not an inexpensive uh, endeavor. And so having that knowledge can help you pick out something that you really like and aren't going to be disappointed in. So I really wanted to go deep into that. If you have any other questions related to it, though, I would really love to talk more about this and answer more of your questions. This is this is a deep, a deep uh, conversation. If you have a specific 
uh, skein or hank of yarn that you're curious about that you want to take a picture of and email it to me. I would love to show the picture and then talk about the things you need to think about as you're, you know, picking a project to go with that skein. So, so let me know, let me know. Thank you so much for hanging around friends. If you've stayed this long, I appreciate you so much. I would love it if you would, uh, like this video, subscribe, maybe share it with a friend who might find all this yarny information helpful. Knit, crochet, man, all of that still applies. <laughs> so share away. Thank you again for joining me and happy crafting.